In this module, we want to begin talking about ceramics, and uh, we're going to talk uh, to start with just about their structure and and uh, the the atomic arrangement that they they have. Uh, this is part one of two uh, uh, lectures on this same module uh, because it's a little bit long. So let's first answer the question: What is a ceramic? Well. A ceramic is just an inorganic compound of a non-metal and a metal. Um, if you don't remember that, ju just if it's not a metal, if it's not a polymer, if it's not a semiconductor, then it's probably a ceramic. Um, it, within a ceramic, the bonding can be either ionic or covalent. And just like we talked about uh, at the very beginning of class, uh, the percent ionic character is going to increase with an increasing difference in electronegativity, which means that the degree of ionic character could be large or small. So if we look at this um, periodic table showing electronegativities uh, below the, the elements, then we can see that, let's say, calcium fluoride uh, with an electronegativity difference of three uh, can, can be a very, have a very large ionic character, where... Uh, something like silicon carbide with a electronegativity difference that's smaller is going to have a smaller ionic character, both of which, though, are still ceramic materials. So now we're going to talk a little bit uh, about the ionic case where we can treat the individual atoms as ions. So what happens is that the metal gives up uh, its electron and becomes a positively charged ion that we call a cation. And the nonmetal accepts that electron, becomes a negatively charged uh, ion that we call an anion. So everything is going to be about the anions and cations in, in this uh, uh, ionic ceramic structure. Okay, so the ionic radius of the cation, which we call RC, which is the metal, is going to be less than the ionic radius R sub A for the, the radius of the anion of the nonmetal. Uh, and the reason is that the, the, the metal gave up its electrons and the, the nonmetal took it up, and so it, it has a larger radius as a result. So another so in keeping with our running example of calcium fluoride, uh, the calcium is a, is a two plus uh, ion. It's the cation. It's smaller than this um, F minus, uh, the fluoride uh, ion, which is the anion. And so we would define each of these RC uh, is the cation radius and RA is the anion radius. And so if this is the general case, which it is for most of ceramics, then we would expect the ratio of RC to RA to be less than one consistently. And it is. So now the question arises, what is it that governs the crystal structure? Because what we've talked about in the past has been uh, the case of metals where where the the atoms are all the same size and we've talked we sort of understand how those structures arise so what is the governing structure of um uh, the governing factor that controls the crystal structure of ceramics so the first sort of governing principle is the maintenance of charge neutrality so let's keep keep with uh, calcium fluoride if we want to create calcium fluoride uh, ca uh, the calcium term is is a is a two plus ion so and the fluoride term is only a one minus ion so we need two fluoride anions for every uh, uh, cation uh, of calcium in order to make the charge neutral and so we would write that as a sub m x sub p uh, that we require for charge neutrality where m is the number of cations required and p is the number of anions required so in this case for calcium fluoride m would be one and p would be two okay and that's we're going to come back to that because that uh, formulation is important for determining the class of structures that we're going to pull from um, okay so that's one factor the second factor is the relative size of the ions uh, so the ratio of the cation ionic radius to the anion ionic radius and what we're going to try to do is maximize the number of nearest neighbor oppositely charged ions. So the the cation wants to be around a lot of anions, and, and the anion wants to be around as many cations as they can. Uh, and the other feature that's important is that all nearest neighbor ions 
sorry, all nearest neighbor anions that are uh, need to be in contact with the cation in order for that structure to be stable. So if we look at the structures that I'm showing here, this left structure is unstable because the the cation, which is in the middle, is not in contact with all of the nearest neighbor anions, whereas this structure would be stable as would this structure. So what matters is the touching of the the cation to the anions, not necessarily the touching of, let's say, the anions together. Okay? So let's see what the implications of these relatively simple rules are. And we'll just consider three anions touching with some cation in the center. So here's the picture that we're looking at. So the blue atom is the cation, and the three red atoms are the anions. And, and they exist just in this sort of equilateral configuration. So this line that runs from the center of the cation, sorry, the center of the anion to the center of the cation, we just write as Ra plus Rc. And then this uh, uh, line that runs from the center of the anion to the midpoint between the other anion is obviously just Ra. So now we have a a right triangle and we can apply all of our trigonometry principles we know that the whole triangle the abc triangle is an equilateral triangle and so the alpha which is going to be half of one of those angles is just going to be 30 degrees so we can apply our uh, simple trig formula and say that ra right here divided by the hypotenuse ra plus rc must be the cosine of alpha or the cosine of 30 which we can find out to be square root of 3 over 2. So if we go ahead and do the algebra, we can find out what the ratio RC over RA is and find that that's root 2, sorry, that's 2 divided by root 3 minus 1, which comes out to be 0 0.155. Well, why is that important? Because if the anion is smaller than that, the structure won't be stable, right? If, if the anion is any smaller, it won't touch all of those, sorry, if the cation is any smaller, it won't touch all three of the anions. And if it doesn't do that, then it's not stable. So there must be a different structure that it adopts. And we could go through a variety of different um, classes of structures and find out what the minimum cation-anion radius ratio is. Um, but what we find is that the coordination number, so remember that's uh, in, in metals, it was just how many atoms were touching any other atom. Uh, in this case, we're going to talk about the coordination number as the number of nearest neighbor anions for each cation. And that's going to increase with this uh, ratio of RC to RA. So look at the table that we're looking at here. So here uh, is the ratio RC to RA, so the radius of the cation to the radius of the anion. And here's the coordination number. And we just did the calculation for this triangular configuration, and we came up with 0 .5, 0 0.155 as being our lower limit. We could similarly look at the uh, tetrahedral configuration, so three atoms and then uh, atom on top. Now we're talking about three-dimensional structures, the anion sitting in, in the middle of those, the octahedral structure, and then finally the cubic structure. And we can see that this, this uh, ratio of the radii uh, basically dictate what, what structure is going to emerge. So for these latter three structures, um, the tetrahedral structure uh, is going to lead us to what's called a zinc blend structure. We'll talk about this real briefly uh, in the second part of the of the um, of the lecture. But basically, you can look at these green uh, anions and the blue cations and see that it it looks pretty much like a FCC structure with the anions with the cations uh, inserted into the tetrahedral sites. Similarly, the sodium chloride. Uh, or this is sometimes called the rock salt structure, uh, also looks like an FCC structure of anions, except now that with the cations existing at the octahedral locations. And then finally, we have what's called the cesium chloride structure. It's a cubic structure of where the, the cubic structure is formed by the anions with the cations in the center. So those are the kind of the, uh, the key features and uh, of various classes we'll introduce some more classes but the classes of um when we all, when we have a one-to-one -one ratio of cations to anions those are the class of structures that can emerge it is important to remember that these are not hard and fast numbers they're only approximate because 
in, in reality, the radius of the anion and the radius of the cation depend on the coordination number, the charge, and the percent ionic character. So those will vary somewhat. So um, we, we have to be a little careful to not uh, make these absolutely rigid. But this, is, this gives you hopefully a, a rough idea for how crystal structures emerge. And the next uh, portion of this module will, will flesh out a little bit more of the complexity of these structures and talk about how we can compute things like uh, density and uh, how we can predict the structures uh, from the get-go.